ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Hello and welcome to another episode of On Air at Rocket Science, a podcast by the Student Council for Aerospace and Geodesy. My name is Jan Luca, sitting next to me, I've got Paula, who like me studying the Bachelor Aerospace. Our guest for today is Professor Alessandro Golka, who is an expert for Pico and Nano Satellites and Satellite Constellations here at TUM. Thank you very much for joining us. It was great to have Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, to get started, we want to play a quick game of this or that. We're going to give you two options and you can just say which one you would prefer. Okay. So, Geo or Leo orbits? Leo. Rome or Munich? Rome. Nano or Pico? Nano. Fully automatic or Porter filter coffee machines? Porter filter coffee machines. Already guess so. <laughs> uh, is systems engineering art or science? Art. To get started and get to know your personality a little bit, um, we'll give you give the viewers a quick run through your CV. So you studied aerospace yeah. in Rome, right. then you did your PhD and some teaching at MIT in Boston, and then you spent nine years as a professor at the Skoltek University in Moscow, Russia, before joining TUM last year as yeah. the head of the newly founded chair for Pico Nano Satellites and Satellite Constellations. So looking at your CV, um, we can see that you experience a lot of different teaching cultures in a lot of different countries, mm -hmm. and we're interested in what the main differences are uh, that you notice uh, between these cultures. Right. So I think the um, Italian system that I experienced as a student uh, is very similar to, to the German system. So it's, you know, knowledge transfer by lectures, right? You listen, you take notes, and then you go and do an exam at the end. Um, what I experienced later as a, as a PhD student and as a professor uh, was something a bit different. So looking at, uh, you know, experiential learning, uh, hands on learning, and basically using lecture time to not only receive information, but also discuss and share, um, which made, you know, made it a bit more interesting. And that's what I keep doing also because as a, let's say, as a professor, that's the only thing I've ever seen and done. So that's what I'm keep doing here at Tum as well. Okay. So, uh, you will kind of implement a new style of teaching here at Tum. Yes. Very interesting. Looking forward to that. Yeah. So you mentioned there's different like teaching styles. Mm -hmm. Um, and at least from my experience, um, a lot of times when I don't understand something, I turn to YouTube and look at videos. Mm -hmm. Um, and you also have a YouTube channel mm -hmm. explaining a new, new yes. space. Exactly. Uh, what inspired you to start the channel? So, uh, the inspiration was exactly what you were saying. So actually what you're saying is validation. So, uh, new generation is looking at YouTube. Right, as a, as a source of information. So it's a very powerful channel. Um, so my inspiration was, okay, I want to have an impact to, to young students, not only where I teach, but around the world. Uh, and uh, YouTube seems a great opportunity. So I started doing that. Um, I will keep doing that in the future, but also in the, in the lectures, uh, my plan is to change the way we use lecture time uh, in class. So when, when, when you teach something like, I don't know, what is a home and transfer? What is an orbit? Uh, you know, space come design, so, you know, like some basic topics. They will, they hardly change, right? So especially if they're related to physics. So uh, my thesis is that you can, uh, you can safely put this information on video, uh, record it professionally once for all. Yeah. And you ask the students to watch this content before class. Then when you come to class, we're going to use those concepts, reason through them, discuss them. So it's, it's a very, it's a different way of teaching, which I think uh, leverages on the advantages of, uh, you know, just new opportunities we have. Would you think of that as, as just an internal tool, internal videos, or would you uh, create these videos in an open open source way, so for example, posting them, um, them on YouTube again? No, I think for for a student audience, I should be open. So knowledge is universal. So yeah. I think not only we need to, of course, primarily serve the students of TUM, but uh, why not share the content with the world? I mean, there, I don't see anything against. It's a nice idea. So um, as I said, you spent some time at MIT and uh, MIT being, sorry TUM, but probably the most prestigious university <laughs> in the world. Um, 
I guess there are a lot of... See three letters, you know. Yeah, three letters. Right. That's the good similarity. But I guess there are a lot of pretty renowned pe people running through or walking through hallways there. Is there anybody you met and maybe are still in contact with, with uh, our, our audience might know sure. and that had a, had a lot of big impression? Oh, I, um, I had a chance to meet a lot of interesting people um, visiting MIT for a reason or the other. Um, so I once attended a speech from Bill Gates, which was really interesting to see you know, a person that I only read about and then you know, listened to him speak about his ideas, about his foundation, what he's doing in healthcare it was really interesting. And he was speaking of pandemics before the pandemics actually occurred <laughs> in the recent times. Yeah. Um, and actually, in this, on the space side, I've met a lot of interesting people. I've met uh, Buzz Aldrin, the astronaut that you know, went on the Apollo 11 mission, and I met Neil, Neil Armstrong as well. Uh, and they were. Uh, this was at the memorial of a former MIT professor, Bob Siemens, who was one of the, uh, if you wish, engineers of the Apollo mission. So he was actually... Uh, one of the decision makers, okay, on, on the on the mission architecture of Apollo 11. So these are the type the type of people that you regularly meet at MIT, uh, which made my student experience really interesting. I have to say, I can imagine uh, how important is kind of that part of connection with people, meeting people um, for universities. Uh, in your opinion, so oh. do you think it's uh, elementary or uh, just a nice add-on? I think it's extremely important. So, uh, and something that you carry on for the rest of your career, right? So I'm in touch with a lot of uh, my lab mates, you know, from MIT who now have interesting positions around the world. And I think I'm going to keep in touch with them. And it's kind of like an extended family. And I think at TUM, you, you have, we have a similar opportunity, right? So we have the opportunity to create this network. Uh, some universities, especially in Europe, don't do that for whatever reason. But the fact, for example, that here there is a student council, that you're doing this very podcast, uh, that you're trying to connect people, uh, it's extremely important because that's what you will carry on for the rest of your career. It's nice to hear. Yeah. So uh, we would now to start with the topic. Mm -hmm. um, so we would like to talk about satellites in general. Obviously, satellites have many applications in our day-to-day -day life. They're like, we cannot live without them at this point. Um, and you mostly focus on smaller satellites, like cube satellites, yeah. right? Um, not necessarily. I will try to clarify this. Okay. Uh, do you want to clarify? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, in my view, uh, small satellites are uh, demonstrators of technologies that could be applicable to any type of satellite. Okay. Restricting your own attention on a specific size and format is quite limiting for no reason. Okay. Of course, in a university, we're never going to build a large geostationary uh, spacecraft. You know, it would be mm -hmm. an endeavor of hundreds of millions of euros right. if you could launch it, etc. Right? But uh, what we can do is to, uh, you know, develop technology that we can demonstrate on miniaturized platforms, right? And also, what we do in the chair is more conceptual studies, and those studies will refer to infrastructure, actually very large infrastructure, okay, uh, for Earth observation, for telecommunications, for anything uh, that we think makes sense, right? So uh, I wouldn't, definitely we're not restricting ourselves only on uh, nano satellites, but indeed, in terms of uh, hardware, uh, we're focusing on them. Uh, but I also don't exclude that in the future we may build payloads instruments that are going to be carried over larger size platforms. Um, as you said, the like first idea probably of smaller satellites is to kind of test your technology because it's a cheaper way, an easier way to launch and test uh, your equipment. Do you think, um, I mean, there's other applications for them. There's Starlink, for example, that actually uses them for communication. Do you think we'll move more towards the direction of using smaller satellites as our day-to-day -day satellites, if you could say mm -hmm. that? Uh, so it's, this is a, this is a complex uh, topic. You can definitely not say that we are replacing uh, large satellites with small satellites. And the reason is that there are some physical limitations on performance, which are driven by size, volume, and ultimately energy, energy density. Um, so, um, you can complement existing systems with small platforms. 
That means web platforms are becoming relevant for operational purposes. Take, for example, the Copernicus Earth Observation Infrastructure, which is uh, developed in Europe uh, and operated by uh, ESA, merged by ESA, the European Space Agency. Uh, they also include in their data ecosystem, they include data that has been taken from small sats. And in fact, two of the small sats uh, I was involved in um, FSS CAT, um, and it was, it were CubeSats. So, um, CubeSats can play a role, but definitely will not be the only, uh, yeah. our platform being involved. That's for sure. So maybe taking a step back, we, we're not talk, talking about, uh, CubeSats. Um, could you maybe once again explain what CubeSats actually are and mm -hmm. uh, why they are so special, maybe in right. size or so forth? Right. So CubeSat is a standard okay, that was uh, developed, uh, if I remember correctly, at Stanford University. Um, was it Cantoni? Was it was, was a... It was Stanford. It was, 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 I think, Stanford uh, by Professor Twix, if my memory recalls okay. correctly, and uh, Jordi Puigswadi. Uh, they basically had this idea, can I put together a satellite within 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter, and about a kilo, something kilos or 53 if I'm correct. Um, so that's one you, okay? And the idea is, okay, that's a module. Uh, you can have satellites that are built on, on those modules, right? So it could be 2U, it could be 3U, it could be 6U, so on and so forth. Uh, why is it popular? It's popular because it's set the standard. Uh, first, it's an it's a inexpensive um, type of platform, uh, so also universities can, can afford them. Uh, also small uh, you know, uh, entities can afford them. Uh, second, uh, there is lots developed in terms of launch infrastructure and deployers, so it, it's already there. And so if you comply with the standard, it would be easier for you to find uh, let's see, more, more inexpensive uh, launch. Is there anything special about them? I don't think so. I mean, it's just it's just a standard. You know, you can have, in fact, because satellites is another standard, you know, smaller. Uh, but um, does it necessarily need to be like that? Not necessarily. Uh, it's just, you know, as we had in the past, DVD <laughs> that became a standard. Uh, so now we have cubes up. Okay. If you uh, use the parallel or the metaphor of, of DVDs, do you think that uh, there is going to be a change in the standard. Like with mm -hmm. DVDs, we've seen that uh, we started using Blu-rays and now, of course, sure. nobody's using even Blu-rays anymore. So you see, basically, if you, if you study the evolution of technology, you would see that over time, uh, dominant architectures emerge. So for example, uh, all the passenger aircrafts today are a so-called tube and leak, right? Uh, all these small satellites, many of them are, are CubeSats, okay? so. Probably there is some, some architectural benefit on being a CubeSat. Will there be something else? It depends on what type of technology will emerge in the future. For example, uh, if the launch cost drops dramatically, you know, from, from the current prices, two or three orders of magnitude less, like Elon Musk says, you know, $30 a kilo, I would suspect the larger platforms become more fashionable all of a sudden, because now you can afford to launch them Right, and you can do so much more, and so why should they do CubeSats anymore? And I don't think that CubeSats will stay there forever. You know, uh, they, they might stay for a long time, maybe until I retire. I don't know, <laughs> but I think uh, you know, uh, definitely we should not just focus on a single uh, standard at the end of the day. If you say that uh, with larger launches and lower uh, launch costs, mm -hmm. we might actually go back to uh, larger satellites. Do you think that? We also there, we will see there another standardization like with CubeSats right now to just say uh, their one unit would be uh -huh. 30 times 30 times 30 centimeters. So first of all, you said we are going back to large satellites. We never, we never, we never went away from large satellites, I guess. Yes. Okay. Um, um, let's say, uh, will there be new standards? Could be, right? So maybe you will have uh, standard platforms. Uh, one of the reasons could be that maybe some company will, will develop in the scale that is sufficient enough to reduce cost so that, uh, you know, it will be cheaper to, to just go with, with that company and that will be the de facto standard. And the more they're produced, the more the barrier to entry increases because the, the cost per unit will go down, yeah. right? What, what will the standard be? Well, I don't have the crystal ball, yes. so I don't know. <laughs> of course. Um, but do you think it's a good idea to make 
launching so widely available. I mean, with Starlink, we saw they have 4,000 satellites up right now. They right. plan on having 42,000. Right. So um, the reason why, in my opinion, a uh, constellation like Starlink came to be is that it's probably the only instance in the world uh, of a satellite operator that has access to launch at cost. Because they also have launchers, right? And they can launch whatever they need. Nobody else can do that, right? Uh, so this sets a de facto monopoly situation, uh, which means uh, that they will, you know, more and more uh, have a competitive advantage, right? Um, so do we need more launch options? Probably we do, right? Um, keeping in mind that launch is a, is a terrible business. You know, the, the profit margins are pretty, really low. It's very really capital intensive business. And it needs a lot of governmental support to, to, to survive in the early stages, at least. Yeah. Uh, SpaceX will not be as it what it is today if the US government didn't support them to this point. Right. So um should everybody have access to space? Um yes, with care. Why that? Because uh space, uh, especially if you if, if if by space you mean Earth orbit, um it's is a limited resource, not in terms of volume, because actually, you know, uh, there is a colleague at MIT, uh, Linares, who estimated a uh, very clever model that around lowest orbit, you're going to have more than 2 million satellites, give or take, you know, between one and two, if I remember correctly. There is, there is lots of space in space, okay? <laughs> so that's not the issue. The issue is about volume. The issue is um, radio frequencies. They are limited, you know, the spectrum management is important. Uh, having uh, responsible operators is important. There's been cases in the past where uh, small sets were communicating at unlicensed frequencies, generating potential interferences and disruptions to, to maybe critical services, right? Um, also, uh, there is the issue of, uh, you know, uh, safe disposal, sustainability, avoiding debris, avoiding collisions. Um, and indeed, there is a security issue to be considered. So, um, but as of today, it's a little bit of the wide west, right? And uh, the current situation survives because the launch rate globally is not too high, to be honest. Uh, and uh, currently, the operators are responsible, so they, they try to they try to have responsible behavior. So, in fact, uh, you know, recently I was speaking to one of those companies, and they will say, if you don't show me that you can deorbit if I bring you in this very high altitude, I'm not going to bring you there. Okay, so, so say, say, this is this is responsible behavior, right? As opposed to I'm going to launch you regardless if you have a you know ready frequency license and regardless whether you have this person ability. So you said that SpaceX might actually have a bit of a of a monopoly in the US right now, yeah. or a probably in the Western world. Well, at that's, least in the in, 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 in the segment uh, of also larger satellites. Would you think that that's maybe another argument to use smaller satellites? Because then you can um, also use other launch providers like uh, uh, Lab or maybe in the future uh, RFA or his aerospace. Uh, or do you do, do you think that's not really an argument that monopoly and that I don't, uh, think, it's a, I don't think it's a primary argument. Okay. I mean, of course, there are different uh, uh, drivers that, that drive your selection of launch vehicle, uh, and in fact, you know, for many European projects. You are forced to use or you were forced <laughs> to use European launch vehicles right? yeah. for for uh, geo returning reasons for other geo geopolitical. Uh, but from a purely engineering performance perspective, that's not optimal, right? So every time you put a constraint, you're putting a constraint to your performance. Of course, that probably also cost optimization if you if you're right. picky with the launches. Right. You mentioned satellite constellations. Um, and I think they're mostly in use for communication purposes. Mm -hmm. What other applications do you see for them? Do you think that's a uh, better way? Um, so the most popular ones are communications, as you mentioned, uh, with low latency uh, and Earth observation. So um, basically getting information about our planet uh, through, um, you know, essentially interpretation of incoming radiation at different wavelengths, uh, and you have some science models that give some 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 
each size that you want, right? Mm -hmm. um, the third big application is navigation. In fact, it's on your phones. So it's on our phones, right? So I wouldn't be able to go home if I didn't have my Google Maps or, you know, whatever, which is which uses a GNSS. So Galileo, GPS, and so on. Uh, so these are the three big uh, cases for constellations. Um, but then, of course, you have smaller, um, not really constellations, but still distributed satellite systems that are for scientific purposes. And of course, there are some defense applications. Uh, uh, what would you say are the advantages of using multiple smaller satellites, for example, in the yield than uh, over mm -hmm. using a bigger uh, satellite in geostationary orbit, which hovers uh, over one point uh, right. of the Earth? So um, it's not like, so again, um, it's never, it's very rarely the case that one orbit dominates the other. Okay. It's always a trade off. Yeah. So uh, the typical trade off in communications, for example, is do you want to have constant coverage with constant access of a certain region of the world? Then you go geostationary. Right. But geostationary means you have to cover, you know, travel time, you know, 36,600 kilometers. Sometimes this round trip has significant delay latency on your communication. If you're speaking of communication, if you're speaking of mass observation, uh, it will have an effect uh, on your resolving ability of the instrument, right? So your options are either that, or you have a satellite in Leo, but satellite in Leo moves relative to your regional interest. So if you need to have some sort of continuity, uh, like in the case of mobile communications, then you need to have more than one satellite. And the, the lower the orbit, the more the satellites that you need. Uh, if you want to have a latency of 20 something milliseconds, which is what, you know, standing does, then you, you're going to be in the region of thousands of satellites. Uh, that's what you're going to need. But of course, since they are um, so much closer to the Earth, you will, you will need much less power, much, you know, much less resources to, to close your link, for example. And so you can afford them being smaller. So we just talked about uh, satellites and there we saw that everything's really interconnected and there's never one perfect answer. So right. it also involves a lot of different departments working together in companies mm -hmm. because there's a lot of different fields of expertise you need uh, to design a satellite. And um, traditionally, I would say that was done with so-called waterfall approach or over the fence approach, I think it's called, um, where every department gets data from, from another department that worked on the project, processes right. it, uh, and then hands it over the next fence to the next department. Mm -hmm. And I guess you worked on kind of a different approach to uh, this um, design studies and um, satellite mm -hmm. design in terms of concurrent engineering, right? Yes. Could you maybe really quickly explain sure. what it looks like? So uh, concurrent engineering is an approach uh, to help speed up convergence to uh, system design. Um, I don't know, what's your favorite system? What's my favorite system? Let's just take a communication satellite. Communication satellite. You know how many subsystems are in there? How many subsystems in there? Um, I think it's hard to name all of them. Um, but let's about, say it, about eight to nine, eight to nine. No, something like that, right? Uh, and each of them uh, refers to a uh, specific specialty. You know, if you're working with attitude control, it has a certain goal, it has a certain driver, and certain type of equipment. If you're working on structure, you have a very different view of the satellite. If you're working on orbit, you have a much different view. So everybody is looking at, at you know different objectives where this product has to operate, um, has to comply, and hopefully maximize. And the problem is that those objectives are contrasting to each other, and decisions taken on one area of the satellite, say the antenna of the satellite, yeah. uh, will have an effect on other specialist work, like on, uh, for example, attitude control, which I mentioned to you. So uh, you mentioned the waterfall. Right. Um, so traditionally, you have, to, you have to almost consider that traditionally you're speaking about large organizations working on these problems, right? They take, uh, you know, these big companies like Airbus, Teles, and so on, OHP. Uh, they have teams that work uh, in different countries, and they're large teams. And somehow they have to coordinate each other, okay? So the easiest way to coordinate is that you have departments working on, you know, the specialties, right? And um, let's say... Uh, what you do, you basically need the working order. That's what you said, right? 
The problem with that is given that uh, decisions on A has an effect on B and vice versa, uh, you will have to go back and forth. And if you have to wait for the whole waterfall to complete, uh, the, your time to completion is going to go with further down the road. Um, the idea of concurrent engineering is to try to accelerate this by having all the specialists involved in a, in a satellite, so, a satellite, but this method can be, can be applied to any type of uh, engineering system okay. in the room and building an integrated model, at least at the early stages, but also you can apply the same ideas at the later stages. Actually, in aeronautics, by concurrent engineering, they mean something that's more in the manufacturing area, you know, uh, co-designing uh, the the products, you know, the aircraft, and the industrial system behind it, like the final assembly line, manufacturing, the chain, and so on. That's the aeronautical interpretation of concurrent engineering. The space interpretation is, uh, especially in the preliminary design, putting together a picture of the satellite that could, as a whole makes sense. So uh, that integrated model, is it, can we imagine that to be, for example, a, a CD file with underlying parameters, or um, how do you define such a map? Wow. So um, CAD, CAD, you mean, right? Yeah. Uh, so CAD is one of the representations of, of a spacecraft. But at the core, actually, you need to have some sort of data model. Of course, data model encodes all the fundamental parameters of a satellite, okay? Um, and hopefully also the relations between them, right? And including as well information on people responsible, because satellites are made by people, all right? Of course. And, and, but if at the moment, at least. At, at the moment, exactly. Um, and then this data can actually be used by all these different specialist tools like STK for the orbit or GMAT for the orbit. Um, you know, CAD for the configuration, I uh, even have uh, SOLIDWORKS, NAS analysis, whatever, for the structural design and, and analysis, fiber modeling. You will have specialist tools for thermal, you will have specialist tools for, you know, the other distance you bought. And the whole point is to orchestrate them all together. And that's, uh, as I said, done, done in one room, and you actually worked, or more often done in one room, as a so called uh, concurrent engineering yeah. facility. And so uh, that's was something a, you worked on at Airbus, right? Yeah. So uh, for a couple of years, uh, I was a vice president at Airbus, and I built the CDF uh, of Airbus in Toulouse yeah. to help set up the technology roadmaps of the company. Uh, as you see, you can apply this methodology to anything. And in that case, the idea was uh, Airbus is you know, investing a lot of money, around you know, 800 million euro a year, at least at the time, on uh, R&T. So breakthrough type of research, yeah. and somehow you need to harmonize all these efforts, and you want to make sure that these efforts have a benefit for all the different products of the company across all the divisions, across all the home countries, and so on and so forth. So concurrent design was a way to do this alignment, harmonization for all of these problems. And um, there you, you really helped developing the, this facility, right? Yes. Um, a right. bit of the... And, and, okay. <laughs> and uh, one maybe a bit provocative question about my ask is um, why do you need a building for that? Can you also do it in, in some standard oh. reading rooms or via Zoom? Why, why do you need oh, okay. such a specific design facility? This debate has been going on for a long, long, <laughs> long time. Okay. okay. Why are we having this podcast here together? Not me, my apartment and in your apartment. Because we want to maybe connect on a personal level and have a personal you discussion. Go. You answer yourself. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty easy answer. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, people get you know need to know each other, especially people who never meet, but they actually work on the same thing. Uh, they need to connect at personal level. Um, they need to make sure that there is an, an understanding that goes beyond the technical parameters. And I think you answer yourself. And I guess that also <laughs> kind of connects what we were talking about earlier with the connections uh, you make at university and then labs, for example. Exactly. Yeah. Why, why is the university not just a bunch of YouTube videos? This is what you want to say, but makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, so you worked at Airbus with that. Um, and you worked there during your time as a professor at Skulltech, right? Okay, for vaccines. Ah, okay. Yeah, because that was our question. How did that come to be? Did they approach you? Did you seek out oh. other opportunities? Or? No, they approached, well, uh, a colleague from MIT approached me saying, would you like to you know, join me in the sabbatical therapist for two years. 
I said, sounds fun. So, <laughs> so I took a leave to, uh, from my professor job. Uh, I, I actually, I had to formally leave, but I never left, meaning, uh, you know, still the students running, so I still had to, you know, go to Moscow once in a while to see them. Uh, but at the time, my primary job was in industry, but it's not in academia. Do you, do you think you would like to do something like that too? If the, like, again, if the opportunity arises, like, just take a couple of years off, follow some other opportunity right. and then come back? Uh, if it makes sense. I mean, it has to make sense. Uh, so it has to be something that, you know, uh, also makes sense for the prosecution of, of, of the academic career. Because I think if you always stay in university, you miss a lot. Okay, you miss a lot of the real world. Uh, you may start detaching yourself from what you know actual projects are, and you live in your own bubble, right? Yeah. Um, which I mean, it's totally fine, but it's not fine with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I like to be in touch with the industry very much. It's kind of leading into the bubble of your rest. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and and you know, in fact, for example, when I did this experience. It also generated a lot of opportunities for students. You know, students had interest in therapists thanks to this. You know, uh, we have it, uh, you know, connected projects in a way or the other. And since today, uh, you know, people connections remained. Yeah. They're opening opportunities for students at home, you know, after so many years. So that's, that's very nice to hear. <laughs> so you see, um, uh, it, that's why I think it's important. It's extremely important. And in your video series, we already talked about. You also mentioned that concurrent engineering is an especially interesting approach for startups. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, potentially, yes. Uh, because uh, so startup, first of all, is not just designing a, a product. That's the minor part. If, if, if you're doing a startup and you think that the technology is enough, sorry, <laughs> sorry to disappoint you. Uh, the startup itself is a system, okay? which is made of people, again, it's made of a business model, it's made of a product, and then, and, and all these things have to work together. And for example, decisions you make on the business model, so how am I going to sell this thing and make money out of it? Of course, has implications on the process, has implications on the technology itself, and so on, and all these things have to be understood. So all these systems, tools, things like concurrent engineering, concurrent design, system dynamics, and so on, they're extremely helpful to basically structure your development and structure your mental model around it, not only for you, but also for your organization. The startups are typically small teams, yeah. and it's quite important that everybody's aligned on a vision. Okay. It's a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So... Here at home, you offer a couple of courses on systems engineering, mm -hmm. and we also mentioned it in the this or that questions. Can you like quickly explain what it is? Sure. So uh, why are there two courses? There are two courses because one is much focused on the theory, but still it's not, uh, it's not a course where, you know, you listen to lecture, take notes and do an exam at the end, right? Um, more and more in the future, I will evolve it. Meaning, um, it's a course in where you take a fundamental knowledge of systems engineering and a little bit of system architecture, you know. Um, in, in your first question today, you asked me, is system engineering an art, art or science? And I told you it's an art. In fact, it depends on which part of system engineering you're looking at. If you're looking at the process part, it's more, you know, engineering, it's science, right? Uh, it's process. Whereas when you're speaking about architecture, creating, Defining something new is more of, more of the art side of it. Okay. Um, so in the fundamentals course, uh, I try to cover uh, more the theory part. And to be honest, I don't put much emphasis on the tools and diagrams, you know. I think that you can learn on your own and you can learn in the industry. <laughs> Somebody's therapist can teach you, whatever. Um, I don't need to do this here. I, I can do something a bit more uh, impactful for your mental, you know, uh, structure. Put it this way, um, which which allows you then to build much better diagrams that you, if you didn't do this. On the advanced course, uh, the idea is, and this is something that I've been doing at Scoltech before, for many years, um, give you an opportunity to practice system engineering on a real project. Okay. Now, of course, I cannot make you launch a satellite in six months, but I can make you launch a stratospheric balloon in six months with an instrument, which could 
as well be a precursor of an instrument to be flown to space later. So would that be really working on a real instrument for a for a, a balloon yeah. that, that would be launched at the end? Well, the first launch is happening this August. Now, oh. three weeks or so, the first yeah. students are launching, uh, um, in their case, a simple camera, okay, um, with some machine learning um, on it. Uh, so this is happening already. Uh, the, 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 let's say, what, what's the bill going to be in the future? Uh, it will evolve. So typically in this course, you get an external customer. So I try to get somebody from industry, from other research labs, from whatever, uh, that have something interesting to fly that they want to fly for free. Um, and uh, I will hand this over to you. And I'll say, here's your customer. <laughs> yes. Here's your boundary. You know, here's your resources. You're given money for it. You're given, uh, let's say, an indication of what you should be doing. And then it's up to you to make it happen using what you learned. <laughs> Can you, like, obviously you get a lot of responsibility. It's your mission. You need to take care of it from start to finish. Can you kind of run us through, like, how that would look? Like a process of like. Okay. Um, you speaking of the balloon, right? The, yes. the, this course. So at the beginning, first of all, you need to have some sort of concept, an idea on how this is maybe a mission. So treat it as such. So you need to have uh, requirements. Okay. So we, we speak about requirements, then you have to, you have to practice them. Then we have to refine them. Um, then you have to define your success criteria, right? Then from there, you will start having a preliminary design of your gondola system, you know, what you will eventually fly yeah. in the stratosphere. Stratosphere can be a really tricky environment at the end of the day because you're staying there for, I don't know, 50 years, depend depending on how, um, you know, depends on the weather conditions, also depends on uh, how much you inflate the balloon versus the mass of the uh, payload and so on. Um, but you're staying there at temp outside temperature of minus 60 degrees. So, I mean, it's quite cold. Uh, and also, basically, there's, there's very little pressure compared to atmosphere. Right? Because you're flying at 30 plus kilometers above the, the Earth. It's like three times an airliner. Right. right? Um, so, you're designing something that can withstand these conditions. So, and then after you do that, you will have to make decisions on what, what am I going to buy, what I'm going to build given my experience, given my team, given the time available and the money that I have available, then you do it. Then you will have to do some testing and you have to decide which test you can do. And, you know, choosing the test, so defining the test and choosing which ones to do, which ones not, it's one of the system engineering tasks that you also in real life. Then you will have to define, uh, uh, you know, the procedures for the campaign. So you actually go to fly and you're not going to fly. You know, once the balloon is up, it's up, right? So you need to have a structured process. It's like this podcast. If you if you don't have a process to check your audio before time, beforehand, to check your images, you may lose this time. Okay. Uh, same thing with the balloon. Uh, and this is like a much cheaper version of a satellite. Right? Say, same thing you can do, you must do with a satellite. Let's say. And then you have to retrieve it. Think out the, the, the end of life. Well, that's, that's kind of the fun yeah. part. <laughs> Because it can end, end up anywhere, <laughs> right? Um, so you have to retrieve it, you have to get the data, you have to analyze the data, and hopefully deliver to your customer the end product. What it serves. Sounds like a very interesting project. Yeah. With a lot of hands on. Uh, oh, it's all hands on. <laughs> so uh, we just talked about uh, the end of life concepts, and that's uh, really important also in systems engineering to think of that. We, a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned. Uh, that even though there's a lot of space in orbit, um, we have to take care that there are no collisions, for example, mm -hmm. uh, to lead to, uh, to no chain reaction that might mm -hmm. um, take all access to space from us. So um, how do you design the end of life of satellites in general? What are measures okay. you can take to safely bring it back? Uh, first of all, you don't necessarily have to bring it back. Um, there are some orbits which are too high yeah. to allow you to deorbit bring it back to Earth. So there will be gradient orbits, right? So, um, in, you know, for example, in interplanetary missions, there is always this uh, sequence of passivation to make sure that you know you, you will disable power, you will disable generation, and so on, to then dispose. Um, and then concerning bringing back to Earth, this can either be uh, naturally done by the environment if it's a NATO orbit, yeah. or you need to have the environment. You know, you need to have some propulsion. 
uh, to be able to the orbit maybe solar uh, drag sail. Um, so you need to have the means to basically get rid of the energy that allow you to eventually be burnt by the atmosphere. And obviously you need to have a structure and analysis of wood that burnt. Of course. So the end of life is very important for the sustainability of spaceflight. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we kind of look at the sustainability, I guess that has to do something with utilizing the resource. So in our case, the satellites already in orbit uh, to the best of our ability. And that's something uh, you try to do with the help of federated satellite systems, right? Right. So, right. so this was um, one of the first large research projects I've been working on. And the idea was, uh, why don't we make use of partially failed spacecraft, or spacecraft that, that basically finished the mission? Can we use them for something else? And if we have to do this, how do we do it? Right? And is this the beginning of a, an infrastructure? Well, it could be where we have a network of satellites that basically offer services that can be tapped, can be mixed and matched to meet certain customer objectives. So you can imagine that it can complement this capability, this capacity with, um, you know, generic service satellites that you, that you will launch for this purpose. So this is an idea, this is the idea of a federation, um, which in fact, now after some 10 years of working in this, now you start to see this idea in practice. So you start to see companies working on so-called space as a service. That's what it is at the end of today. Um, do you think it's going to be like a made solution? It's going to be like widely used in the future? I, so speaking of data, companies are working on this right now. And it's one of the uh, biggest trends. Uh, in terms of sustainability of space, okay. uh, one way or the other. I think we're going from a present in which we have missions. Mission means it has a start and an end. In the future, when we want to speak about space infrastructure, it's like your highway, it's like your you know road system in the city. It doesn't have a start and an end. It has a start and it has maintenance. That's where we're heading. So I think the idea of satellite federations help for that. Uh, what are the main challenges that still exist that um, kind of hinder us from, from already implementing it on, on large scale, having it implemented sure. right off? So um, the challenge, well, there are several challenges, right? So first one is the technical one. So satellites may actually not be able today to interoperate. There are ways to solve it, okay? So you can always have some sort of intermediary nodes to have the networking among the heterogeneous protocols and networks and so on. But then you need to have the agreement with, with many operators. Yes. And uh, space is a, a traditionally conservative industry. And so uh, may not be so easy to, to, to align all these different stakeholders to different countries to, to such a ambitious common goal. Um, so this, uh, this, I would say, are the main uh, a block immediate blockers. Uh, so next, we want to move on to um, to new category in the podcast, uh, something uh, premiere right now, which is called science or fiction. And uh, in this category, uh, we present uh, our guests with kind of outrageous, almost crazy seeming uh, ideas in the field of research, and interested in whether they think that, let's say, in the next twenty to fifty years, so okay. rather near future in terms of uh, aerospace engineering. Can uh, I say something though? Yeah. Fiction has always been historically inspiration for science. Yeah. Look at Star Trek. Look at the books from Asimov. What you saw there in the 1970s is a reality today. And that's exactly what we're interested in, whether you think these ideas will kind of stay fiction in the next, mm -hmm. let's say, 20 to 30 years. Let's make it a bit okay. a shorter, uh, or might actually become science uh, All right. during that time. So we already talked about using satellites for communication, obviously. Um, and there's the idea to um, have phones, mobile phones, connect to satellites directly right. and use them send messages or something. For now, uh, we the signal from our phones are sent to the nearest cell tower and then from there to antennas that can even like bring the signal to the satellites and back. 
So obviously that kind of limits our ability to cover all of the Earth because you need to be close enough to a cell tower to have reception. Mm -hmm. um, and companies like Apple say they can implement this by the end of this year or next year in like SOS messages, so in a limited kind of way. So this is already happening. My phone in my pocket, that's this already. So do you think this is going to be like... Well, it's on, it's on yeah. the yeah. <laughs> the, the question is if it's going to stay emergency yeah. messages oh. or oh. you think yeah. that sometime in the future um, we will mm -hmm. watch Instagram videos uh, or uh, whatever uh, via satellite interface. Okay. So you're speaking on very two different things, right? So yeah, so, so that's what we're seeing right now. We're interested in what might come in the future. So this is something happening in the near future next door. There are two companies nowadays. One is called AST Space Mobile, and the second one is called Link Global, which are actually realizing this um, supposedly with a startup service by the end of 2024. This soon. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Um, Basically, what's the idea? The idea is uh, to quote unquote hack uh, terrestrial protocols to be able to work with cell towers, but instead of being you know fixed on Earth, they're you know orbiting around space in the world, right? Um, and being able to close the link with uh, cell phones, and to do this at a, in a cost-effective way, right? Because that's that's the problem. So technically speaking. If I have a dedicated satellite, you know, even a CubeSat can close a link with a, with a cell phone, with a single cell phone for SMS. This has been proven already by an Israeli company called Sky and Space Global. They have done it, uh, I think, a few years ago. The problem is to do this at scale. So when you have to connect the, you know, I think now on the planet, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, there are more cell phones than people on the planet. Something like this. Uh, or comparable number, yeah. Yeah. man. Uh, if you think of how many cell phones you have at your home, you have yeah, probably had a couple of old ones. Yeah, you got them, yeah. Right. So, so there is a lot of cell phones, and to connect all of them and the growing demand of the future, this is the challenge, right? So probably at the beginning, the service is going to be able to connect only certain number of users at a relatively high price per message or per call, you know, per minute. And then this price will go down as soon as the adoption goes up. And this has been historically the case for anything, you know, airplane uh, tickets, phone calls. I mean, you're, you're too young to remember, but when I was like a kid, right? I remember in Italy, you would pay a certain price for the call if it was in the city. You would pay another price if it was between one city and the other. You don't remember this, right? Between different countries, definitely, and and also within Germany, but not from city to city. To see, yeah, so it, it would actually it would actually change the it would change the prices substantially, and of course, internationally it was ballistic price, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, and think about today, you know, uh, now we can call any anywhere in the world at relatively inexpensive prices, right? Um, the same is going to happen with this direct direct uh, communication to cell phones, but it will take time. But I think also the, the rate of adoption, you know, the speed at, at which these things are, are growing, it's actually getting faster and faster. So it cannot it can be much faster than we think if the service picks up. The second idea we want to talk to you about is called Solaris. And it's a currently ongoing a study about the feasibility of space-based solar power on a large scale. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a plan promoted by ESA where they want to launch up to 16,000 tons of solar satellites into orbit and uh, collect sol solar power there. They say it's more uh, reliable, more, mm -hmm. more efficient, uh, for example, because um, uh, there's no atmosphere, no clouds, whatever in the way. And then uh, send that down to Earth uh, via radio frequencies or uh, lasers. Do you think that such such a constellation is uh, realizable from your knowledge? Right. So, um, and again, the answer is it depends. <laughs> So um, let's look at the fundamentals, okay? So we're speaking about transferring, well, converting uh, solar radiation into electrical energy, which we know more or less we know the efficiency of that, right? So if you look at uh, um, state of the art solar cells, it's between 25 and 30 percent per unit. Um, then it's a question of storage and transmit it back. So you, you, you're going to have an efficiency factor there too. 
Now, obviously, on on uh, in space, as you said, there is no atmosphere, so you will get the full 13, 1380 watts per square meter available at that distance, as opposed to the about you know good conditions thousand uh, watts per square meter on the ground, which have to be converted anyway, and it's usually less because of uh, in different latitudes where you are. Yeah. Okay. Um, in space, you always have peak power because you're always looking at the sun very nicely, right? If you have the way to align your solar panels. Um, so th there is indeed a lot of power out there. The big question is, can you transport it efficiently and at a cost that allows you to be competitive to the next best alternative? This is the key, right? It's the same reasoning of, you know, when you, when you look at uh, oil and gas, right? So. Uh, producing oil from uh, deep sand, you know, the, 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 the sands in the north of Canada or something, it's very expensive. Yep. But when oil price is very high, they, they may think of doing it, right? Uh, but when oil price goes, goes down, it doesn't make any sense. So here, the big metric is how many euro or dollars per, per kilowatt hour uh, is it? Um, now, don't ask me the numbers because I didn't do any specific study on this. Um, I think, um, though, that's currently, if I remember what I saw this some time ago, um, the cost of a kilowatt generated in space is too high um, by, I think, at least an order of magnitude compared to the next best alternative. And this is the challenge. So is it possible technically? Theoretically, yes with many technological problems to be solved and, uh, you know, with a very, at the moment, low efficiency in terms of, uh, uh, you know, energy translation. Um, the, the, big, the big issue is economics. Uh, launch cost drives this economics very much. And once again, if we're able to reduce the launch cost by several orders of magnitude, say two or three, this might become something viable. Um, so you say that it's technically possible um, another question is whether we should make it possible. So no. do you think it makes even makes sense to send solar satellites into space with with a rocket that uh, one way or the other has some uh, climate impact? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that makes sense or should we just uh, keep the solar panels down on our feet even with the lower efficiency? So definitely, I think this is the point of the Solaris program of ESA, is to do this life cycle assessment because it's true that you have clean power, but you need to have the satellites, you need to dispose of them. You, you will have all these rocket launches, okay? Yeah. Um, they will have to be maintained because this constellation has to be replenished. Uh, you will have all the transmission of power, which is gonna have as well uh, some receivers from the ground, I guess, right? Uh, you will have the storage of this energy because, you know, uh, once, you, once you produce it, you have to store it. Of course. Yeah. So, um, so you have to look at the sustainability problem from end to end to really make uh, uh, a judgment whether this is worthwhile or not. I didn't do the study myself, so I don't I don't like to make statements based on guesses. Yeah, I'm just telling you this is what somebody has to do and show us uh, and uh, basically have roadmap. This is probably something on the long term horizon, um, more than tomorrow. Yeah. I guess that we have to wait for for the result. So. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're usually used to hearing like kind of crazy ideas, if I may call it that, from new startups, new companies, mm -hmm. not more established ones. Um, and I think especially in aerospace, which I mean, compared to other industries, is a relatively new sector. Um, do you think like startups are very important or do you think it's better to rely on more established companies? Uh, uh, well... Okay, startups are important, right? It, it's also, a, you know, it's an exciting career path for young people that can, you know, can try make a bet relatively low risk on their careers because they're just starting something. But it's not necessarily the case because you also have startups that are built by experienced people from industry and right? who leave their jobs to start something they really believe on, right? Um, with space startups, in my opinion, uh, one has to be extremely careful not to get in love with the technology, which is sometimes the case. You know, people are so passionate about space 
they just don't do the numbers, but they just like the idea, <laughs> right? Um, and that's usually, uh, you know, unfortunately a recipe for failure. Because at the end of the day, the startup has the ultimate goal of making money and growing and be profitable and be self-sustainable. If you always have to rely on external investment to grow and to maintain your operations and generate zero revenue, you may have a beautiful technology, but you will die sooner or later, like sooner or later. In fact, uh, you can mark my words, you know, I'm ready to see this on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> but uh, in the next uh, 18 months, we're going to see a lot of, uh, you know, consolidation, put it this way, of, of this new space market, because now the economics environment has been evolving, changing, you know, it goes by cycles, right? Now we are in, this, in that part of the cycle where there is not so much investment in technology, right? Uh, for a reason or the other, connected to the to, to the to the global economic cycle, um, and so many of those startups who don't generate revenue and they need the constant investment, they would face an issue uh, to you know pay pay stipends and survive essentially. Uh, what would you say are good parameters for, for example, students that want uh, that are looking for a job mm -hmm. because they just graduated? and uh, think about joining a startup for them to assess themselves right. whether that's going to be a startup that will fail within the next 18 months or has a good future. So in my opinion, uh, especially when you're younger, taking high risk, it's extremely important. It gives you a lot of reward. Um, you know, I can give you a personal example. In my academic career, I kind of took a risk. I went to a startup university in Moscow that nobody knew. And actually it didn't exist even, you know, in a place I've never been. Uh, it was the best choice for my career. You know, I'm so happy I did it, right? And I learned so much because I could see so many different aspects of, you know, how to how to found a university that I have never seen uh, anywhere else in the world, at MIT, at Tomb, Stanford, wherever, you don't see that, yeah. right? Because they're consolidated universities. But when you go into something new, you learn a lot. So. Also, if you're looking at, you know, uh, industry type of path, definitely going into a startup, regardless whether this is going to be successful or not, you will learn a lot. So um, to me, it's a great, great thing to do. Uh, why not? Okay. Um, and I mean, you mentioned building from ground up a university is an entirely different thing. And Tom is very established, but the aerospace department here is yeah. very new. I mean... Sure the last year was the first one. Do you think like you can bring any of the ideas or any of the like knowledge you gathered from like building the university to this department? Absolutely. Well, that's the idea, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that's what I'm trying to do, right? Of course, it's a, it, it, again, it's an entirely new problem because essentially you're trying to create something new within an established framework which has established processes and established rules, and you're trying to grow your new things within this box, right? Okay. Uh, which sometimes requires also bending the box. What's what's one point where you w might want to bend the box? Um, I don't know. Um, basically, I, I don't have a specific example, but what I can say is uh, we I try to do what I think it's right and good for the students and for overall for the university in the way I think it's right, yeah, right. Hopefully, and and of course not just me. You know, with with you know with the team that I'm building, and you know, with all the partners and stakeholders of this endeavor, right? Um, and then essentially you try to make it happen. That's that sometimes it requires uh, breaking walls, right? So I guess it's gonna be exciting to see <laughs> what what that holds. So we just talked about startups. Come back to that to that um, topic. Let's go back into the imaginary world, just like we do with science or fiction. If we imagine that you had a billion dollars to spare, you know, mm -hmm. a billion dollars of free investment, you can just throw at any crazy technology. It doesn't necessarily have to be with an aerospace. Mm -hmm. What kind of startup would you try out yourself? Right. So I don't have a concrete example right now, but uh, I will tell you how I would reason about it. Yep. Um, I would like to find uh, a problem that I'm passionate about in solving, and that hopefully has the largest possible impact. Okay, and then is it gonna be space or not? Not necessarily space, okay? Um, of course, uh, you know, uh, 
I, I dedicated my career to the space field, so I know some things about it. But I also think that what I learned in this field can be applied to many other different fields, right? Um, and if you think of space per se, it's actually a very small, small community, you know. Um, so it may be very impactful in certain problems. It may be totally relevant in other problems. So uh, to me, it's one of the, it's one of the tools, one of the possible solutions, but not the only one. Um, but I would definitely look for impact. That's that's that would be the driver. Okay. With something that I also have an idea on the, on the business model, at least at least an initial idea. Mm. You know, ideas change, ideas evolve, um, and you end up with something very different. But if I only think of the technology, uh, I think I'm going to fail. Right? I need to have technology and idea on how I'm going to use it and with whom and how I'm going to send it. Okay. And uh, now let's imagine that you find that uh, life-changing idea and mm -hmm. let's start, start a startup. Would you base it here in Europe or is there something uh, that you would mm -hmm. want to have changed and uh, that, that would need to change within the European startup market uh, and regulations or the right. investment sector for you, for you to do so? Well, um, it, it has to be wherever it makes sense, right? Now, the big challenge in Europe that we have is that right now it's, okay, let's say relatively easy to start a company and find the seed investment, you know, something half a million, 100K, a million, easy. But when it comes to the next stage, you know, when you need to raise five, 10, 20, 50, it becomes exponentially harder and the availability of this type of funds in Europe is much more limited than other parts of the world. Okay. So then you start to become global. So um, one of the challenges, well, one of the uh, challenges would be for Europe to prop up into this uh, challenge, right? So bring more money to help the scale up. Right. Okay, so we're kind of coming to the end of the podcast. We mentioned, well, you mentioned earlier how important it is to, like, foreign, foreign bonds and um, contacts within university. Do you have any advice for, like, new students also coming the next semester on mm. how to do that, how to approach it? Right. So, first of all, um, there needs to be uh, a willingness to be open, right? Join projects. Um, within courses, outside of courses, uh, extracurricular activities, all the opportunities that you have to connect with people. Because again, uh, your uh, you know your study mate, your colleague, is going to have a great career as you will, right? And it will be great if you get, keep in touch, right? And if you'll be able to do things together you know, over years. So, in my opinion, um, there will be many things you will learn and forget but these personal connections will stay. Um, basically, what you're looking for from a university education is a way how to think properly, how to think as a scientist, how, how to think as an engineer, and maybe have some knowledge that will stay with you, and then all the people you met. That's what really remains to you at the end of the day, right? And uh, don't forget that companies will not hide you because you know how to solve Navier Stokes equations, you know, but, uh, which you can't anyway in an exact form. Um, they will not. They will not hire you because you know how to to you know solve complicated equations most of the time. Of course, there, there are also positions for that, right? But they they hire you for being a good team player. They hire you to be a good you know having the right personality, having the right knowledge uh, in terms of competence. You know, like am I able to solve the problem? Because most of the time, what you will see in industry is something that you know is new, and you need to find a way to solve it, right? And in science, even more. <laughs> I guess that's a really nice closing sentence. So thank you very much for taking the time sure. of joining us today. It's been a pleasure. And uh, for inviting. Anytime. Oh, anytime, yeah. <laughs> um, and also thank you to you, the listeners, for taking your time and uh, listening to another episode of Kinair. Actually, Rocket Science. See ya. <laughs>